I stood at the living room window, waiting. Finally, the garbage truck pulled up to the curb. A heavyset man in a bright orange vest stepped off the side and spat dryly onto the pavement. He hoisted my garbage, coat rack included, into the back compactor. Joy. Climbing onto the truck, he unceremoniously tossed the aluminium bucket back onto the road. My relief vanished. Inside the bucket was a left behind, a foot-long splinter, a lingering remnant of the coat rack. Bursting through the front door, I yelled after the garbage truck and it lurched to a ground I yelled after the garbage truck and it lurched into a grudging stop. I forced a smile, strode across the yard, bent over, reached into the can, grabbed the splinter of wood and tossed it into the truck. The man blinked disinterested towards me as they drove off towards the next house. The truck's compactor pressed down with a satisfying crunch. Goodbye, coat rack. There was a strange comfort in it, as though the coat rack itself had some special power over me. A power which, upon its destruction, had lifted. Strolling back towards the house, I caught myself smiling, almost feeling happy. I wrapped my hand around the front doorknob and a sharp pain shut up my wrist. My arm swung back like electric shock. Gritting my teeth, I turned my palm over. A splinter, about the size of a blood test needle, was lodged in between my thumb and pointer finger. Ouch. I breathed in, pinched the splinter, yanked it out and tossed it back over my shoulder. I stepped inside. As I pulled the door shut, red smeared across the brass knob. I turned my hand over again. A thin line of blood trailed out from the puncture hole, snaking down towards the tip of my thumb. Wrapping my other hand around the wound, I marched back towards the kitchen. Bandages were in the tray on the top of the fridge. After I finished wrapping my hand up, I turned around and leaned back against the fridge, marveling at how quickly my good mood had soured. All it took was a wooden splinter, but then another thought crept into my head. Part of me, the paranoid, irrational part, wanted to go back and find the splinter, take it out past city limits and burn it, just in case. I actually had to fight the urge to go back and do this. It's just a coat rack, I reminded myself. Nothing more, nothing less. Either way, I took comfort in the new security setup. Alarms on every door and window. Big stickers advertising the system to any would-be intruders. I even checked every corner of the house, just to make sure nobody was hiding inside. Don't be too careful. Despite everything, I still hadn't fully processed the fact that somebody had taken the time and effort to break into my house and set a coat rack in the basement corner. Not steal anything. Not even moving anything. Just a coat rack in the basement corner. This simple fact stuck in the back of my head like a stubborn popcorn shell stuck between teeth. The worst. Hunched over my laptop at the kitchen table, I took a sip of bitter black coffee. Thanks to the pandemic, all work was homework now. But that was fine by me, I preferred staying at home to just about everything else anyways. Typing away, I was finally falling into that ever-elusive zen state of work, coding line after line until my phone buzzed against the plastic vinyl tabletop. Unknown caller. I reached over and froze. Something told me not to answer it. Something told me to block the number, but I shook it off and answered regardless. Brandon? Said the voice on the other end. I couldn't tell if it was a question or a statement. Uh, speaking? I'm calling about a note, he continued. The, the one on your doorstep? He sounded young, early twenties perhaps. Okay. Yeah, I was the one who left it there. I didn't respond. I didn't know how to respond. Look, I know it's weird. Trust me, I know better than most. The thing here is to make sure you understand what's going on. To make sure you take it seriously. Does that make sense? I didn't answer. He sighed, anxious. <sighs> I know you think I'm crazy. Shit, I might be. I just... I need to talk with you in person. I... Don't call this number again. I said plainly and ended the call. Setting the phone down, I leaned back on my chair and crossed my arms. Looking back, I regret my coldness here. But in my defense, I had seen enough real-life horror by then. I was pushing 40 and well acquainted with the crushing mundanity of real-life suffering. I had no desire to indulge in this made-up nonsense.
My heart skipped a bit as the pounding on the front door continued. I slid back on my chair and stood up. Fist clenched, I marched across the room and yanked open the door. There stood a young man, tall, and dressed in a white shirt with black denim pants. Look, I'm really... Sorry to be this persistent, but... Immediately I recognized his voice from the phone call, but I had to admit, his appearance was surprising. Until now, I imagined a Weasley-looking basement-dwelling internet troll, but this guy almost looked like a low-key movie star. Young Marlon Brando vibes. Regardless, I didn't know what to say. He looked down, kicking his feet awkwardly on the ground. He looked up. I, I just need five minutes, he said. I'll explain everything and never come back. His eyes were filled with sincerity. Years of suffering hidden beneath a desperate smile. I looked around. Other neighbors were milling about, a few glanced over, concerned. I looked back to him. Fine. My voice drifted with skepticism. He looked back over his shoulder and then back to me. We can't talk here. Let's go for a walk if that's alright. I consider myself a pretty good judge of character and he didn't seem dangerous. He seemed worried. If anything, my curiosity was driving now. Overcast grey fell over the suburbs. We walked down the street, side by side, six feet apart, silent. Our shoes scraped against the concrete, and the smell of outdoor barbecues lingered in the air. He looked back over his shoulder. We were about four houses down from mine. First off, he said, looking forward again. I want to apologize. He slid his hand into his pockets as he walked. <sighs> I don't really know the best way to approach something like this. I'm sorry for being so cryptic. I grunted, non-committally. Second, I really don't expect you to believe me. Unless I saw something firsthand, I wouldn't believe me either. He looked up at the clouds and squinted as diffused sunlight cast against his face. The sky was spitting rain now, in invisible drops you only felt, sporadic. I see. Pinpricks against the skin. Maybe I am crazy. I don't know, he shrugged. My dad was. At least that's what we all were taught until he finally... He trailed into silence. Anyway, I'm getting off track, he said, running a hand through his jet black hair. Just take it seriously for the first couple of weeks and see where it goes. If it's bullshit, well, then it's bullshit. I still wasn't quite sure what to say. At this point, I believed that he believed, but that wasn't enough to change my entire worldview. That wasn't enough to start believing in sentient coat racks. All you can do is search for ways to slow him down. Invite people over as much as possible. Try to figure out if there's a way to stop him without breaking the established rules. I know there's a pandemic, but hell, invite a stranger over if you have to. It should at least buy you some time. Who lives in your father's house? I asked with a directness that surprised even me. I... I, I don't know. You don't know? He shrugged. I haven't been there since... Again, he trailed off into silence, grimacing. He looked around as if the words might be somewhere close. I grew up here, he said, changing the topic once again. My sister and I used to collect pine cones in the park. He pointed across the street. Park was a generous word for an empty lot with a couple of trees and a bench. We would sell them to the neighbors. He almost smiled. Pine cones with googly eyes glued on them, five cents apiece. He shook his head like a chill went down his spine. Look, you've just gotta take the rules seriously. I still wasn't convinced. You don't know who's living in your own dad's house? I persisted. Did you sell it? He stopped walking and turned to face me. Don't, don't try to understand this, trust me. He rubbed his forehead with the back of his thumb. The more you try to make sense of it, the more you try to rationalize it, it only gets worse. Sounds like a death cult mantra. Sure. You have my number, right? I nodded. If anything happens, if you have more questions, just call me anytime. Seriously, any time. Four in the morning, if you have to. I, I don't care. Okay. It's Mitchell, by the way. Just Mitch is fine, too. He gave a little wave, turned away, and strolled off down the street, leaving me even more confused than before. 
Worse than that, part of me was beginning to consider the possibility that this might actually be real. A possibility made all the more disturbing due to the fact I'd already broken nearly every single rule. Classic horror movie fuck up. Either way, his sincerity was unsettling. By the time I got back home, it was already dark out. I stood at my front door, rifling for my keys when... Brandon? A familiar voice called out from behind. I turned back to see Howie, standing on the curb. I almost didn't recognize him at first. He wore a blue tracksuit with a blue pencil tucked behind his ear and blue headphones wrapped around his neck. This guy really liked blue. Howie? I said. Neighbor's kid spoke to you, huh? He rested his hands on his hips. I nodded. What'd he say? He shrugged. Same stuff as the note. Howie shook his head, as if to say I expected as much. Poor kid, he said. At least he'll stop bugging you now. Yeah. Just then, beside the house across the street, the outdoor motion light snapped on. Odd. Howie looked back to see what I was looking at. Through the cracks in the fence, a lined silhouette stood up against the boards. It was hard to tell from the distance, but it almost looked like somebody was standing there, watching us, peering through the fence cracks, motionless. But the yard was filled with junk, so it could have been anything. Anyways, he started pulling up his headphones and turned away. Who's living there now? I said. Howie froze, lowered the headphones and turned back. Uh, uh, not sure. They never sold it? Nope, not to my knowledge. So, it's empty? I've seen someone, maybe a few someones, milling about inside. Ever seen them outside? How he tilted his head, thinking. He clearly never paid much attention to it. Uh, I don't think so, but I got goldfish memory these days. He chuckled, shrugged, reached to pull his headphones back on and... Oh! His face lit up. I've been stuck on this. He pulled a crumbled piece of paper out of his jumpsuit pocket and read, A thin piece of metal, which glows brightly when a current passes through. He looked up at me, eyes filled with hope. Eight words across. First letter F, third letter L. The light across the street snapped off, and the light inside snapped on. Window blind shadows cast from inside as someone moved across the living room, a drifting silhouette. Brandon? Filament. I said, I still locked in the house across the street. Howie scribbled away. That's it! My god, that's it! He sounded like he'd just won a thousand bucks. He looked up at me. You're brilliant! I looked back at Howie. Glad to help. Anyways, said Howie, enthusiasm suddenly gone. See you around! He pulled his headphones up and jogged away. I stood there, watching the house across the street. The light inside was still on. But no more movement. I turned back to my door and stepped inside. Pulling the door shut behind me, I strode into the living room and stood at the window. The house across the street was dark again. Okay. I pulled the curtains shut and turned back to the kitchen. I sniffed. The strange smell of gasoline and burnt hair lingered in the air still. Subtle, but unmistakable. I flicked on the kitchen light and sat down at the table and stared blankly at the wall. Hard fluorescent glow vibrated against the white stucco. I should get warmer light bulbs. And then another thought crawled into my head. A thought that was slithering around in my subconscious for the past few minutes. Mitchell, the dead neighbor's son, did not put the coat rack in your basement. Of course, it is possible that he did, but after talking with him, it seemed highly unlikely. And this raised another, even worse question. Who put the coat rack in the basement? Howie? Doubtful. Another neighbor? Possibly. The person of the persons living across the... The sound of a door popping open interrupted my thoughts. I looked back over my shoulder, across the living room. In the front entrance hallway, the basement door was open. Just a crack, a thin line of darkness. Fuck it. I marched upstairs, grabbed my switchblade from the bedside table and stormed back down, each footstep heavier than the last, knife clenched in my left fist. I swung open the basement door and flicked on the light. I'm armed, I said, trying and failing to sound like a threat. If anyone's down here, 
Make yourself known now. Silence. Nothing but the hum of bustling light bulb. I took a deep breath and exhaled. Okay, I whispered, taking a slow step forward. I used to mock people in horror movies for always going down into the basement, but in the moment, it weirdly felt like my best option. It was that, or leave the house, or try to sleep while knowing that someone might be hiding in the basement. Call the cops? Tell them I found a coat rack that didn't belong to me? Most cops don't even have time to worry about stolen cars, let alone misplaced furniture. None of these choices were appealing. I reached the first stairwell and stopped at the first corner. Somehow the hallway seemed darker than before. I flickered the light switch, warm glow cast over all. The light wasn't working the last time. I stepped forward. The familiar smell of burnt hair and gasoline was getting stronger. The short walk down the hallway feeling like eternity. Finally, I stepped into the rec room. Both corners were empty. <sighs> Breathing relief, I felt blood rush into my face. But once again, embarrassed by my own paranoia. Embarrassed by my fear. I pocketed the switchblade and turned back when... Something caught my eye. In the far right corner, behind a stack of cardboard boxes. Water. A thin layer of surface tension slowly spreading across the shiny concrete floor. Fuck. I never said anything about leaks when I bought the place. I crossed the room and squatted down. There were scattered clumps of wet dirt too. No obvious source for the leak. Strange. The circle of water slowly expanded outward. I stared into it and my crystal clear reflection stared back. I needed a haircut. Drip. My face rippled as a single drop fell from above. Of course, I looked up. Drip. Nothing but pink insulation and 2x4 beams up there. Could be a faulty pipe, I thought. Might explain the weird smells too. The basement door slammed shut. I jumped to my feet and whipped out the switchblade. Then before I could process what had happened, everything went dark. Pitch fucking dark. A kind of dark that makes everything sound like it's right next to your ear. A kind of dark that make your thoughts visible. I fumbled for my phone, but it clattered onto the floor. Fuck. I dropped to my knees, flailing in the dark, sliding my hands across the cold, smooth concrete, desperately searching, searching for the light. All the while, the smell of burnt hair grew stronger. No phone. Only concrete and cardboard boxes. Fuck, 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 fuck. Panic rose inside my chest like a swelling balloon threatening to burst right through my ribcage. I froze. I breathed in. I breathed out. I breathed in. I breathed out. The panic stopped growing. It didn't get worse. It didn't get better. It merely held in a state of pure survival mode. I could work with that. Clenching my eyes shut, I rose back to standing. I didn't even know which direction to go anymore. Following my gut, I took a step forward. Another step. Another. Up ahead, seven quick thumps staggered down the staircase and slammed against the corner wall. Silence. Deafening silence. A sliding sound scraped against the drywall as if something rose to standing. A sickening chill went down my spine. My hand clenched tight around the switchblade. You have about three fucking seconds, I said, once again failing to sound like a threat. Three seconds went by. Five seconds. Ten. Only silence. The sound of my own panicked breath and silence. Fuck it. Knife pointing forward, I rushed ahead, screaming my best attempt at a war cry as I flew through the dark, running faster and faster until my ankles caught against the first step and I sailed forward, slammed chin first into the corner stairwell, swiping and flailing the blade like a madman all the while. The lights snapped on. I squinted as my eyes adjusted to the sudden brightness, flat on my ass, backed into the corner of the stairwell. There was nobody here. I looked up the stairs. Nothing. I looked down the hallway. I froze. Stood in the rec room center, shattered, splinters held together with nails and wire. The coat rack. 